Welcome to this edition of Sports Medicine Concepts Informative Friday. My name is Mike Sindoma, Program Director at Sports Medicine Concepts and host of the Informative Friday series. Today we're going to take a specific look at the SGH football helmet from Simpson. Now remember, the objective of the IFS review is not to pass judgment on the helmet as a product, nor to validate or discredit any of the manufacturer's claims. Our only objective is to see what influence the product might have on our ability to complete critical care tasks or to complete safe handling maneuvers during management of a critically injured athlete wearing the helmet. We'll be using the RPSH to provide a more objective review. See our RPSH review segment to learn more about our review process. A special thank you to Jessica Hurlba, Kirsten McKinnis, Caitlin Kilcoin, Vincent Williams, and AJ Licata from Alfred University for helping us with this Informative Friday segment. We began our review of the Simpson SGH by making sure our helmet was properly fit to the athlete. We referenced Simpson's online video instructions to ensure that we were following manufacturer recommendations. We did start with a properly fitted helmet, though we found the process of fitting the Simpson SGH to be quite cumbersome. When properly fit, our model reported that the Simpson SGH was not very comfortable and subjectively reported that it did not feel very good to wear. Our model athlete does not normally wear the Simpson SGH, so his comments are likely the result of a comparison of the feel of the SGH relative to his regularly worn helmet. Now that we have a properly fitted SGH, our first question was if the SGH would have a negative impact on our ability to reposition an injured athlete. As we clearly demonstrate here, the SGH had no effect whatsoever on our ability to complete an efficient log roll push maneuver. Now, according to our RPSH index, we have to compare the helmet against our standard condition, that being an injured non-equipment laden athlete. In this case, I gave the helmet five rolls of tape because I felt the helmet actually facilitated our ability to secure the head and neck, maintain inline stabilization during the log roll push, and position the athlete into cervical neutral. Next, we wanted to see if the helmet would influence our ability to care for cardiac issues. When combined with shoulder pads, football equipment can be a barrier to effective carotid pulse assessment. Pulse checks by pre-hospital care providers are notoriously inaccurate, even without any equipment to challenge the process. We didn't find finding and assessing the carotid pulse to be any more challenging with an athlete wearing an SGH than with any other helmet we've experienced. That being said, performing and assessing pulse checks on equipment-laden athletes is a skill that needs to be practiced regularly. We gave the helmet two out of five rolls of tape for ability to find and assess the carotid pulse because the process of finding a carotid pulse is complicated by the presence of the SGH. But it is important to note that this is the case with any football helmet. It seems intuitive that the SGH would have no influence whatsoever on our ability to secure proper hand placement and AED pad placement during delivery of high quality CPR. And this certainly was the case. Next, we wanted to know about the influence the SGH would have on our ability to establish and maintain a patent airway through which we could provide rescue breathing. As is the case with all football helmets, the face mask of the SGH complicates our ability to assess breathing. Performance of an adequate modified jaw thrust is also complicated by all modern football helmets. The SGH did not complicate this process any more than any other modern football helmet. As is the case in all modern football helmets, Removal of the chin strap eases the completion of a modified jaw thrust maneuver. It has been suggested that removing the cheek pads from football helmets may facilitate the completion of a modified jaw thrust. The cheek pads in the Simpson SGH snap into place, but as demonstrated here, we were unable to remove the cheek pads in a reasonable amount of time or without significant movement of the head and neck. We have found that removal of the face mask from most modern football helmets will allow for easier completion of a modified jaw thrust maneuver without having to remove the cheek pads. The SGH face mask is secured to the helmet using traditional T-nut and screws to hold loop straps on the forehead and shock blocker fasteners laterally. The combo tool approach is the current best practice approach to face mask removal. The combo tool approach would suggest that we first attempt to unscrew the face mask attachment hardware using a power screwdriver. Use of a power screwdriver on the Simpson SGH hardware posed no issues for us. In the event that we were unable to successfully remove the hardware using the power screwdriver, the combo tool approach would suggest that we use a cutting device to cut the loop straps and shock blockers. As the manufacturer of the FM extractor, we have an obvious bias due to commercial interest in the FM extractor. Having said that, 
We found the FM extractor to be very effective in cutting through both the traditional loop straps on the forehead of the helmet and the shock blockers laterally. Should face mask removal fail completely, the sports medicine team may elect to remove the helmet from the athlete. We have found that removal of nearly all modern football helmets is quite easy using traditional helmet removal protocols. We perform this task under a number of typical scenarios. In no situation have we found that removing cheek pads or deflating air bladders facilitates removal of any modern football helmet. In fact, these steps only seem to delay access to the airway, produce significant movement of the head and neck, and prove to be very uncomfortable for the athlete. The same holds true for the SGH. We first began our helmet removal procedures by removing the helmet without prior face mask removal and by only unbuckling the lower chin strap clips. Using this protocol, we had to take the added measure of aiding the chin strap over the athlete's nose, but this is typical of any football helmet when using this protocol. Next, we removed the helmet after cutting the chin strap. Although we did not have to worry about making sure the chin strap cleared the athlete's nose, it did not seem that removal was significantly easier when we cut the chin strap completely. Obviously, once any helmet has been removed, it is no longer an issue in completing any further critical care tasks. However, if the helmet is left in place with the face mask removed, it could pose an issue to completion of other critical care tasks, including placement of airway devices, performing rescue breathing, transfer, transport, and equipment removal protocols. With the SGH in place and the face mask removed, there is no physical barrier to placement of any airway adjunct. Here we demonstrate that the SGH proves no obstacle to rescue breathing using a BVM. Now that we have our critical care tasks taken care of, we wanted to look at how the SGH might influence our ability to complete various safe handling techniques. Traditionally, football helmets are thought to aid in stabilization and maintaining cervical neutral position of the head and neck while completing various transfer and immobilization safe handling techniques. We found this to be true of the SGH during transfer and immobilization to a long spine board and found nothing to indicate the helmet would complicate transfer to an EMS gurney, to provide advanced care during transport to the ER, or to management within the ER relative to any other modern football helmet. Now that we have completed our formal review of the SGH football helmet, we can elect to assign two additional recommendation bonus points. Although the SGH football helmet didn't result in any critical failures, nor did it seem to significantly impact our ability to provide critical care relative to other football helmets, none of our reviewers were inclined to assign the additional allotted bonus points, based on two primary considerations. First, we found the fitting process to be very cumbersome, and the pads placed within the helmet shell to create a custom fit just don't seem like they would hold up over the course of a season. Thus, we were not confident that proper fit could be maintained for any length of time without undertaking a laborious maintenance and refitting routine a process that is not realistic for most programs. Second, research shows that a helmet must be properly fit and maintained in order to get whatever protective qualities the helmet offers. A helmet that is comfortable when properly fit is more likely to be worn properly over the course of time by an athlete. Our model athlete self-reported that although the helmet was very light, it was not at all comfortable, and he would not likely wear the helmet if given the choice. Since our review is based on comparison to a model condition, that being a non-equipment laden athlete, any piece of protective athletic equipment is going to complicate on-field management relative to the model condition. Thus, no helmet or piece of equipment could ever receive a perfect score. Our reviewers felt that the Simpson SGH football helmet posed no significant challenge to our traditional on-field management protocols, but fell short of recommending the SGH football helmet based solely on this criteria. With nothing to say regarding the manufacturer's claims to protection or benefits relative to any other modern football helmet. So, the Simpson SGH received an average score of 2.6 and a raw score of 63, which nets the Simpson SGH three rolls of tape, about a half a roll lower than our average.